Just a quick note before we begin, when I was recording this, I had such an astonishing amount of information that I wanted to convey, so I actually broke this topic down into two separate subjects. Part one is going to be Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel and the Slabatk Revolution. Part two is going to be Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel and the Musser Ideology. This is episode one. Episode two is going to be uploaded in a week, and you keep an eye out for that. So here's episode one. Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel, known the world over as the altar of Slabatka, was and is the greatest builder of Torah over the last several centuries. The burgeoning yeshiva movement today, and indeed, the fact that yeshivas did not go extinct a century ago, is due to him more than any one person. He was the first to combine two of the greatest movements of the 19th century into one formidable potent and unstoppable force. When he opened the first Musser Yeshiva, thereby marrying the modern Yeshiva framework of Valajan with the powerful Musser movement of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. The Yeshiva that he built in a small suburb of Kavna in Lithuania called Slabatka became the premier Yeshiva in the world with the closure of Valajan in 1892. But he also founded and supported numerous other yeshivas all over Europe as well. Rabbi Nassim Svifinkel, the altar of Slabatka, was a master pedagogue who had deep understanding of human psychology and had a craft and mold students to achieve their maximum potential. And he was able to skillfully train cadres of capable young men into becoming veritable Torah giants and who then went on to found and head yeshivos in Europe and later in the United States and in Israel. Indeed, almost all yeshivas that exist today, both in the United States and in Israel, and I guess probably in in Europe or England, stem from his influence and his students. He was also notable to be the first one to open up a yeshiva in Israel in 1924. It was then British Mandate Palestine when he founded the great yeshiva in the ancient holy city of Hebron, Hebron. It's hard to imagine what the Jewish people would look today if not for him. Uh, Yet, despite the fact that he really changed the world, the Jewish world, he remains a mysterious and secretive figure. He was intensely private. He went out of his way to conceal his aptitude and his greatness and his character and his piety, he was an unknown. And for me personally, this is a subject, an individual, and a story of great personal interest to me for several reasons. First of all, my grandmother, she should live and be well. My father's mother, she was born in this small town in Lithuania called Slabatka. And her father and grandfather were actually part of the faculty of this yeshiva, of the yeshiva in Slabatka, founded by our subject. Her maternal grandfather, Rabbi Dov Tzvi Heller, was the younger mashkiach, the younger spiritual dean in the yeshiva. And her father, my great-grandfather, Rabbi Avraham Grudzinski, was the altar's primary student and the Menahel Musari, the Musar dean of the yeshiva. As an aside, the reason why our subject, Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel, was called the altar, meaning the elder of Slabatka, was because there were two mashtiachs, two spiritual deans in his yeshiva. There was an older one and there was a younger one. And he was the older one and therefore he was called the altar, or means the older. And the younger one was my great-grandfather, Rabbi Dotsi Heller, and he was the younger mashtiach. So that's one reason why I'm particularly interested in this subject and this individual. Family connections aside, I also have an absolute absolute fascination with the character and the persona of the altar of Slabatka of Rabbi Nassim Svifinko. He was someone who, like many great Jewish leaders, really carried the weight of the Jewish people on his shoulders. And he was so gifted and he had such wisdom and such ingenuity to push the right buttons in his students and in effect change the face of the Jewish world. This Jewish History Podcast is sponsored, is dedicated in honor of Jeffrey and Beth Yars. 
If you would like to sponsor a podcast or if you have any questions or comments, please email me at rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I do respond to every email. Now, we don't know very much about Rabbi Nassim Svi Finkel's youth. We know he was born in 1849. He was orphaned at a very young age and he was raised by his uncle. Uh, he got married and he moved to the city of Kelm and he became a Madid. He would go from town to town giving inspiring speeches and then he was discovered. Someone realized, someone saw that he has potential to be something so much greater than just a traveling peddler of inspiration and he became a student of one of the disciples, one of the prime disciples of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, and his name was Rabbi Simcha Zissel Ziv. So the pivotal shape, the shift in the life of our character, of Rabbi Nassim Svifinkel, the altar of Slabatka, was when he met Rabbi Simcha Zissel Ziv, who was known also as the altar of Kelm. So this might be a little confusing, but in our story, there are two altars. There's the altar of Kelm, the student of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who is the teacher, and his student, his disciple, his successor as the primary figure in the Musr movement is the altar of Slabatka, Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel. Now, the altar of Kelm was someone from a different planet. He had two study sessions of Torah, Talmud, every day. Each session was eight hours long. And he would study it standing. Each prayer, every time he davened Shmon Esri, the Amida prayer, took him at least an hour. And he studied Musa an hour a day. And he would only sleep in four 30-minute increments. He was the exemplar of Musa. He was the prime student, disciple after, after all of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, of the founder of the Musa movement. And he was a man, like Musa preaches, who had complete self-control. He was entirely in charge of everything that he did, every thought. He would weigh every word with precision as if he was counting gems. Every single movement was calculated. They say about the altar of Kelm that his eyes never veered on their own. They were like nailed down. So if he wanted to look to his left, look at his nine o'clock, he would turn his whole head, swivel his whole head to the side to see it. And that was another characteristic of, of Musser about self-control, even with respect to your limbs, to, to not move them in random ways. They would always talk about COVID Roche, of, of having a certain heavy, literally a heavy head. I mean, it means a certain seriousness to not be whimsical and to not be swayed by every little thing, to be in control. So this altar of Kelm, the teacher of our subject, because he was so fastidious about every movement, they say about him that he would wear clothing for 30 years and they wouldn't tarnish. They would, they would look brand new because he, it was like putting it on a mannequin. He wouldn't move in any way that, were, that would interrupt from its natural state or for, from its uh, pristine state. And, you know, did this, this theme of, of, of Musser, of the Musser masters, to be in total control, the, the theory behind it is that Musser is the tool, of course, to integrate Torah into our lives. But really, it's the tool that's going to enable us to be distinguished from animals. You know, animals have instinct and we have instinct. Animals have whims and we do. The difference is, is that a human can have self-control. It's possible for a human to, through free will, to gain self-control. So how do you gain the self-control? Via Musser. And the story goes that the altar of Kelm, he famously said that Darwin, well, Darwin discovers that man comes from an ape. And he says, well, of course Darwin says that. Because Darwin in his whole life never met a human. Everyone he's, everyone he meets is, they're all apes. They're all, they're all animals. However, I, I saw a human. I saw Rabbi Sraw Salanter, my teacher. And I know for sure that a human doesn't come from an ape. What he's trying to say is 
that what Musr, what it reveals about a person is that someone is not subject, is not beholden, is not limited to the whims, to instinct. They could overcome it. But if you never saw someone who overcome the instinct, well, what the, what's the difference between a human and an animal? And that is the persona, the teacher, the guiding light of the altar of Slabatka. So he meets him and he becomes his student. But the, in Kelm, the city of Kelm, the, the altar ran a small boutique yeshiva. This was maybe a forerunner for the yeshiva in Slabatka that we're going to talk about at great length. But it was a boutique, it was a small, it, was, it wasn't on a very large scale, very few students, but they were committed to studying and to self-perfection in an almost fanatical way. Uh, for example, my grandfather used to say that in Kelm, so they would have students would get married. So we know there's a lot of frantic preparations before the wedding. You got to get dressed and you got you to gotta take care of all, all the arrangements. So, you know, what, what, what does a groom do? A groom has to prepare. Well, in Kelm, they would study, in other words, they wouldn't leave the study halls only two hours before the chuppah, two hours before the wedding is supposed to start. Then they would go over to the administrator and ask for permission to leave a little bit early to prepare for the wedding. Why? Because we have, you know, we follow a certain curriculum. A certain, you know, there's a certain schedule, and we're Muslim masters, and Muslim masters don't deviate from the schedule. We're, we're trying to, we're, we're following what we're supposed to do. So when Rambam C. Finkel he arrives in Kelm, and he's going to be exposed to the the Musser ideology. He wasn't sold yet on Musser. And they, the people of Kelm, the students, the giants of Kelm, they weren't sold on him. But they recognized that he had immense talent and potential, and they advised him to formally request to listen in on a shmuz. Now, a shmuz is a Yiddish word for a Musser discourse. And in Kelm, you were only able to listen to the Musser talk, to the Musser discourse, if you asked permission. So he asked permission and he listened in on one of the altar's discourses. And when he heard it, it was such a transformative experience. He was captivated. He was sold. And he became his dedicated disciple. Rabbi Nassim Sifinko, the altar of Slabatka, every year would celebrate two holidays. Number one, the day that his teacher became a student of Rabbi Sol Salantar and he accepted Musser, and the day that he met his teacher. He would celebrate it by wearing Shabbos clothing and by saying, reciting the Hallel, the praises that we say on festivals. Now, Rabbi Nassim Svi Finkel, the altar of Slabatka, made it his life's work to build Torah and Torah institutions to save the Jewish people. As we've said many times, Due to a variety of factors, the 19th century was arguably the worst one in terms of Jewish vitality, of Jewish continuity. Torah study, traditionally the pastime of our nation, and Torah scholars, the Jewish heroes of yore, were demeaned, were ridiculed, and were diminishing rapidly in numbers and strength. Rambam Svi's goal and his great insight was to infuse the yeshivos, infuse the bastions of Torah scholarship with the Musser of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, to make a marriage between the two most powerful, or not, maybe not two most powerful, but the most powerful institution of the Torah world, the yeshiva, and the most powerful pedagogical and ideological, ideological movements in the Torah world, Musser. And he began his career really young. He was in his 20s when the altar of Kelm first hired him to work in his own yeshiva. After several years, he moved to Kovna, where he opened a kolel, which is like a yeshiva for married students, which would eventually morph into his eponymous yeshiva. In 1881, 
there was a new idea, a new model of a yeshiva that was conceived by the altar of Kelm. This was a new model because it combined Torah studies with Musser and secular studies. And the idea was to cater to the upper classes who were most susceptible to abandoning Torah in favor of the Haskalah and thus to use this new model of yeshiva to stave the Haskalah off. So the altar of Kelm opened one such school in a city called Grubin, and his student, the altar of Slabatka, Rabbi Nassim Svifinkel, joined the faculty. And the idea was that this would be the like the concept. You know, they have a concept store. They try out new things, and once they're able to refine the model, they put it on a massive scale. The idea was to take this yeshiva, this new idea, and polish and, and finalize and fix the model and then open many of them throughout Europe. But ultimately, this whole idea of combining Torah and secular studies was too problematic and it was abandoned. So after a short stint in Grubin, Rabnastasvi Finkel went to Slabatka and first worked as a mashkiach, as a spiritual dean in a smaller yeshiva there. At the same time, he founded the yeshiva in Tells. But his major breakthrough came in 1882. At the ripe old age of 32, he founded the Slabatka Yeshiva, which was initially a yeshiva within the Kovner Kolel. He carved out in uh, amid the, Ko- the Kovner Kolel his yeshiva for unmarried students. At that time, the altar had a the altar of Slabatka, that is, had a fateful meeting with Rabbi Sraal Salanter, who was already in his 70s, and in his waning years, he would pass away one year later, 1883. And he presented the Rabbi presented this new idea of combining Musa with the Yeshiva movement, and he received guidance from Rabbi Sraal Salanter as to exactly how to do it. And one of his students Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, who became the Rashi Yeshiva of Torvadas in New York, incidentally also my namesake, he said that the altar was not a thousand percent convinced of his plan until he spoke it over with Rabbi Sral, a second student of the altar, uh, who also later on became a Rosh Yeshiva in New York of Chaim Berlin, Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner. He once asked his teacher, he asked the altar, if he considered Rabbi Sral Salanter his Rebbe. And he responded, I regard him the same way a convert regards the rabbinical court that converted him. Which seems to imply that Rabbi Yisrael Salanter actually converted him to the ideology of Musser. And the famous line from that fateful meeting was when Rabbi Finkel asked Rabbi Yisrael, what is the direction that yeshiva that a yeshiva sh- that he's establishing in Slabatka? What what the direction should they take? And Rabbi Sroll responded with the verse in Isaiah to give life to the spirit of the downtrodden and to give life to the heart of the depressed. So the yeshiva was open to 1882, and it was a yeshiva within a kolal with very few students, and it actually took a long time, roughly 15 years before the Slavat Yeshiva had taken its final form. In the beginning, the Yeshiva did not have its own Rosh Yeshiva. Traditionally, the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva, is the one who would give lectures, Talmudic lectures to the students. So instead of a Rosh Yeshiva, they would have members of the Kolel, members of the advanced Talmudic institution for married men, they would lecture for the students of the Yeshiva. But also, because it was a subsection of the Kovner Kolel, and it was dependent upon it for, su- for, for funds, the altar didn't really have his autonomy to run the show. And it took a while for them to wean themselves from the Kolel to fundraise on their own, which you know brought with it its own set of concomitant problems, given that Volazhin, still open at the time, Valajan only closed in 1892. So Valajan is the flagship yeshiva of the Jewish people, 
and they were the only ones fundraising for yeshivas all across Europe and even in America. And now there's this new upstart, this new Slabodka yeshiva, and they felt that this new yeshiva is encroaching on their territory, and they actually sued them in a rabbinical court. But uh, all those hiccups aside, eventually the final form uh, of the yeshiva was beginning uh, to surface. In 1889, they got their first Rosh Yeshiva. He was a great gon, a great genius, who was on par with the great Rabbi Chaim Salavechik as the greatest Rosh Yeshiva of his generation. His name was Rabbi Itzala Rabinowitz, known as Rabbi Itzala Panovitcher. Now, this, this relationship between the altar of Slabatka and his new Rosh Yeshiva there was some friction that developed uh, because the altar, he was all about crafting giants of Torah and Musr. And he showed a certain favoritism to the students that excelled in Musr. Whereas the Rosh Hashiva, he preferred those who were fantastic Torah scholars. And thus, after five years, they parted ways. Reb Itzala, the Rosh Hashiva, he left and he went to become a rabbi elsewhere. And the altar actually sent 10 of the best students with him to continue teaching them. And he was replaced with co-Rosh Hashivas, who incidentally were brothers-in-law, and both top graduates of Alajin, one of them, Reb Isser Zalman Meltzer, and the other, Reb Moshe Mordechai Epstein. It's also interesting that the yeshiva itself in Slabatka, did not have an official name until 1892, uh, when the Volazhin Yeshiva, which was called Eitz HaChayim, or Eitz Chaim, when it was closed, the Slabatka Yeshiva adopted the name. Uh, so for the five years from 1892 until 1897, the Slabatka Yeshiva actually was called Eitz Chaim. In 1897, there's actually going to be a schism and the Slabat Yeshiva is going to split into two, and each one of them is going to adopt their own name. Now, Reb Nassim his plan was not limited to his own yeshiva. He sought to open Musr yeshivas all over Europe. So in the early 1890s, he sent one of his co-Rosh yeshivas, Reb Isser Zalman Meltzer, along with 14 prime students, one of them, incidentally, being the altar's own son, Rabbi Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, he sent him to the city of Slutsk to establish a new offshoot yeshiva there. And this will become a pattern over the next several decades. Periodically, the altar would send a cadre of top students to other towns, either to establish a new yeshiva, or if there was another yeshiva that needed a boost, it needed support, was facing some sort of crisis, he would send a group of students to bolster and strengthen and solidify the yeshiva. For example, in 1905, the altar sent 10 prime students, including his son-in-law, Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Scher, and Rabbi Hill Yaakov Weinberg, and his son the aforementioned Rebbe Yudo Finkel, to the city of Mir to support the yeshiva there. And eventually he would also send uh, one of the great characters of the Muslim movement and of the pre-war yeshiva world, Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz, to go to Mir as well. And they built there a super yeshiva in Mir, uh, of course, which is today the largest yeshiva in the world. All told, in his lifetime, the altar populated 14 other yeshivos with his students, thus spreading and solidifying Musr in the yeshiva world. And today, there's much more than 14 yeshivos that has the that have the altar's stamp on them. In fact, there's very few yeshivos in the world that are not directly a byproduct of the altar's handiwork. In 1897, there was a major dispute about the inclusion of Musr in yeshivos that resulted 
in a schism in the yeshiva. The yeshiva was split into two factions. There were many students who really didn't buy in to the altar's innovations. And they didn't like the whole idea of bringing Musser into the yeshiva. Now, besides for the students in Slabatka, all over Europe, there were many rabbis who were opposed to the notion of Musser and yeshivos. And a letter condemning Musser and yeshivos was written and signed by many distinguished rabbis, including, incidentally, the first Rosh Yeshiva of the Slabatka Yeshiva, Reb Itzala Rabinowitz, uh, Reb Itzala Panaviger. Uh, one notable exception to the signatories in this letter was Reb Chaim Salavechik, who did not sign it despite being a Musser opponent. He was an opponent of Musser. He was an opponent of Musser and Yeshivos. So they went over to Reb Chaim Salavechik and they asked him, why didn't you sign the condemnation letter of Musser and Yeshivos? And he responded, listen, I agree. I agree, it's, it's wrong to take the Talmud to take the Gemara and to close it and to start studying Musser. But in our world, there's something much more wrong going on. There is, for example, he gives an example, and he, which is a, a microcosm or, or, or which is indicative of what's happening all over Europe. In, there's a Russian school in Volkivsk, and there's children from wealthy Jewish observant families and they go to school on Shabbos. And even though they're not able to carry their books on Shabbos, they have non-Jewish servants carrying the books for them, and they don't write their lessons until Shabbos is over. But the point is, even though these are Jewish and observant children, they're not experienced in Shabbos at all. And says Reb Chaim, there's a much greater problem that our community and our nation is facing, and yet everyone wants to protest only Musser. And therefore, our I'm not going to sign off. There's much bigger problem, much bigger fish to fry. So it's interesting. The Chazon Ish, who was an opponent of Musser as well, again, not opponent of Musser, but opponent of Musser in the yeshiva, and he once walked and attended a Musser discourse of the altar. And the altar asked him, why did you come? Why did you hear Musser? And he tells him, you know what? I, I am opposed to Musser, but I'm much more opposed to the opponents of Musser. I think today it's a good lesson for us that there's many people who are opposed to one thing or the other and everyone loves to make all kinds of protests and condemnations. But even if you're opposed to something, it doesn't mean that you, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mandate that you have to rail against it. So there's this whole movement against Musser in 1897. Uh, now more locally, there is a rabbinic court that's assembled in Slabatka to address the question of Musser in Slabatka. And they essentially rule that Reb Nassim Tzvi Finkel must dissociate from the yeshiva that he founded and he has to leave because he's introducing Musser and it's not right. So he hears their ruling and he walks into the base medrash, he walks into the building and there's 200 of his students that he, in the, in the institution that he built, and he announces, today I am resigning from the existing yeshiva and I'm establishing a new yeshiva. Whoever wants to join is welcome to join. And he opened up in the same city, in Slabatka, a new yeshiva. And of the 200 students, 50 of them joined him. And this new yeshiva became known as Knesses Yisrael, which means the Congregation of Israel, named after Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. Now, the altar's perspective is unchallenged, even though there's going to be, even in this new yeshiva, there's going to be future students who are anti-Musser, but this one was opened without any doubt that this is going to be a Musser yeshiva. It's interesting his Rosh Yeshiva, his partner, Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein, was offered a huge salary to stay with the existing Yeshiva, but he refused. He says, I'm going with Ramnath and Svi. The truth is with him. Now, the original Yeshiva, they took on the name of Knesses Beis Yitzchak, the uh, 
congregation of the house of Yitzchak, and both yeshivos, both incidentally founded by the altar, continued operating concurrently in Slabotka. In 1904, Knesset Beis Yitzchak, they landed the great Rabbi Baruch Ber Leibowitz, who was one of the prime students of Rabbi Chaim Salavechik, as their Rosh Hashiva. And you have this amazing golden era where in the small little town, the small suburb of Kovna, you have the greatest Talmudic lectures in the world in one building. And down the block, you have the greatest Musar discourses in the world in a different building, both in the same small town, in different and competing yeshivos. And there's all these stories about students from both institutions sneaking in to hear and absorb great Talmudic lectures in one and great Musar discourses in the other. Uh, though Knesset Beis Yitzchak, the old institution that the altar abandoned, that a big head start, after all, they had 150 students to 50, Knesset Yisrael, the new yeshiva, the new Slabat yeshiva, eventually caught up and surpassed in size and in prominence and in numbers. Uh, but I think it's a remarkable testament about our subject, about Ramnasen Svifinkro, about the altar, his character. He's voluntarily walking away from the yeshiva that he spent two decades building because he refused to disobey the commandment and the ruling of the rabbis of the court. And it's interesting. There's another story that uh, perhaps the reason why he stopped taking a salary from the yeshiva was because of this same quality. The story is told that the altar was once traveling by train and he saw an old Jew wearing a talus and tefillin and reading the famous Musar book, Sha'arei Tshuva, The Gates of Tshuva, written by Rabbi Yonah in the 13th century. So he's so excited. His co-traveler is a Musarite. So he approaches him. And he discovers that his fellow passenger is the Aderes, the rabbi of the city of Mir. And this rabbi discovers that the altar is from Slabatka. He doesn't know who he is. He just knows that he's this person is from Slabatka. He was actually not a supporter of Musa. He was an opponent of Musa. And he tells the altar, not knowing who he's talking to, I heard that there is a great dispute with the Mashkiach in Slabatka with regards to Musa. The Mashkiach ought to be fired. So the altar hears the straight rabbi telling him that he should be fired. So he says, well, the rabbi said the ruling. And he decides, I'm, 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 I'm fired, so I can't take a salary. He, he stayed in all, along with the yeshiva, but he, he stopped taking a salary and would only subsist from his wife's small shop that she ran in Kelm. After some years of abject poverty, and the altar had to marry off a child, a very expensive endeavor. And he called on Reb Chaim for a ruling, is he allowed to take funds from the yeshiva? And Reb Chaim told him that he had to take the money because otherwise the yeshiva would suffer. Something remarkable, about, just as an aside about Reb Chaim Salavechik, despite being an opponent of Musr, he was still a very friendly, very close, and very warm relationship with the altar. Now, in 1903, the battle over Musser resurfaced. Things got very divisive for a time. The proponents and the opponents of Musser were actually segregated in the base marriage, in the study hall. But the battle over Musser was not the only existential threat to Slabatka. In fact, a far greater threat loomed large. The yeshiva world had already experienced a half a century battling the Haskalah movements of all their varieties in Europe. And in the end of the 19th, and the early 20th century, there's this meteoric ascendancy of these two other movements that really caused a, a tremendous impact, a negative impact on the yeshivas. Uh, namely, political Zionism in the 1890s and the fervent and revolutionary spirit of socialism in 
in Russia. Uh, sadly, many yeshiva students were swept away by these movements. They left their yeshivas and many also abandoned their tradition. Uh, these factions, they operated as an enemy from within in the yeshivas. They would actively try to dismantle and to pry away the best Jewish minds to their cause. In most yeshivos, a staggering percentage of the best and brightest students were lost. In fact, the altar's own son, tragically Ruvala, he actually became a socialist and he abandoned Torah. What's really noteworthy, and people at the time noticed that, is that the Musr Yeshiva of Slabatka and its offshoots actually feared much better. And afterwards, when observing the fact that the Musr Yeshivas were almost entirely inoculated from the tides that overtook the non-Musr Yeshivas, many uh, erstwhile opponents of Musr realized that the altar had come up with this powerful juggernaut of Musr Yeshivos and many anti-Musr Yeshivos actually came aboard and adopted the Musr approach. So I want to go through what was the altar's methodology and outlook? How did he interact with the students? And you know what really defines his attitude on Musr and how he implemented that in the Yeshiva? So the first dominant characteristic about the altar was his modesty and his concealment of his behavior. Uh, He did everything he could to cover up his own greatness. Despite the fact that he was a world-class Torah scholar, in fact, he knew the Talmud by heart with Rashi's commentary by heart and much of the Tosfos and vast parts of the code of the Shulchan Aruch by heart, none of his students ever saw him studying. He would would study only in hiding. It's also uh, interesting that many pointed this out, that whenever he would sign his name, he would sign his name with his initials. And if you read just the initials, it read Hatzafon, which means the hidden one, perhaps alluding to this characteristic of doing everything in a modest and hidden way. Uh, When his students, when they published some of his talks posthumously, they named the book Or Hatzafon, which means the hidden light, which really captures his enigmatic and dichotomous personality. He was, on one hand, a fiery beacon of light that illuminated the whole world, yet he was completely hidden, the hidden light. Now, there was a five-volume set of books on the Musr movement called Tnuat Hamusa, which literally means the Musr movement, written by Rabbi Dove Katz. And in book number three, he gives an incredible example of how the altar would study Torah secretively. Uh, So his uh, wife after she moved from Kelm to Slabatka, So they lived actually in the yeshiva building. And it was a tradition, still is somewhat today, on Thursday nights for yeshiva students to study Talmud the entire night, overnight. And she would sometimes invite some of the yeshiva boys who were up studying Torah the whole night, invite them to, to the house, and she would give them tea or coffee or cake or whatever. So when they would walk in, they'd find the altar in bed, covered up, and everyone was tiptoeing, and everyone's very quiet. They don't want to wake him up. And his wife, by chance, she actually divulged that, yeah, you don't need to worry about it. He has been studying with you the entire night, and whenever he finds out that you're coming in, he pretends he's sleeping, he climbs into bed and makes believe he's sleeping. That was his policy. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to, to note that this is really the Musser approach in general. In general, it's all about your internal world. It's about making yourself perfect. And the way you make yourself perfect is not by 
publicizing your greatness. So that's a general Musser trait outside of the altar specifically, uh, to cover up and to not broadcast your own greatness. But there's also another reason why the altar did not want to publicize his personal greatness. And that is that he had a, uh, a focus that his own students should each carve out their own unique individual path towards their greatness, to develop and to cultivate their inner individual abilities and style. He didn't believe in this cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all approach. And he didn't want his students to just say, oh, this is what my rabbi does? I'm just going to copy everything he does. Why? He doesn't want to create legions of androids. He wants each person to become his own greatness as indicative by his own character. And there's actually a very famous Dvar Torah, very, very famous Torah insight that the altar of Slabatka would say, and it really, it really brings home this point. And the Talmud tells us that Lot, Abraham's nephew, he was a resident, a citizen of the city of Sodom, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, yet he was saved. And the Talmud asks, why was he saved? And the Talmud answers, you know, what merit did he have to be saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? And the Talmud answers that when Abraham and Sarah were going to Egypt, and you know, this is in Genesis, and Abraham, he told the Egyptians that Sarah, his wife, is his sister. And of course, Lot knows that's not that's not true. Yet, and Lot, Lot could have ratted them out, says the Talmud, the, re, the reason why the merit that Lot had to not be destroyed, to not be killed in Sodom and Gomorrah was because he was quiet, he was silent, and did not tell the Egyptians that Abraham is telling an untruth or an incomplete truth. And the question is, really? That's all Lot had going for him? Read the stories in Genesis. Lot did all these incredible self-sacrifice acts of kindness. You see, when he actually meets those angels coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he treats them with superlative kindness. And he invites them in, and he's so gracious and so welcoming. And also we know there's a famous Talmudic teaching about his daughter, of how much dedication and self-sacrifice that she had to support poor people and to feed them, to feed the hungry. Why? If we're, if we're looking for a merit for Lot, why is the only thing we could find the fact that that he was quiet when Abraham said that Sarah is his sister. And that's the question of the altar. And he answers that all of Lot's kindness stemmed from Abraham. Lot, was when he did kindness, he was just copying Abraham. That wasn't his own that wasn't what he came to independently. He was just copying. And whenever you're copying someone else and doesn't have your own spark, that's not going to save you. And therefore, and then this was his, this was his idea. Each one of his students shouldn't just be copying someone. If you're going to build your spiritual legacy, don't just say, give me someone and I could, I could just copy who everything they do, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just copy like a, a monkey see, monkey do. And it's actually interesting if you were to survey all of his great disi disciples, you'll find that each one of them is great, but each one of them is very different. They're each their own man. And that's because their teacher molded and crafted them and treated them each the way he felt is most likely to bring out and to unleash the greatness within each one of them. Now, 
Reminiscent Steve Finkel actually covered up his role in the yeshiva as well. He didn't just cover up his own personal behavior and greatness. He did everything he can to conceal the vital role that he played in the yeshiva. He had no official title. He didn't, he didn't sign any documents for the yeshiva. He didn't have an official stationary or letterhead as, as is customary for the Rosh Yeshiva. He ensured that he wouldn't be recognized. He wouldn't even sit in the, in the Mizrach. We know in, in the yeshiva today, in the front of the room, you'll have the whole faculty. The Rosh Yeshiva, the Mashkiach, all the, all the rabbis, all the heads of the yeshiva will sit in the front. He sat in the middle. And many students did not even know, even after years of being students of Slabatka, that he had founded it. You know, they would just come and listen to him because he was really interesting. And he was a great Torah scholar. And he had a lot of very inspiring and interesting things to say. And they kind of liked listening to him. Uh, but they didn't know that, they, no one imagined that he was the one who actually was behind everything. He, he would, in fact, spread the rumor that the Rosh Hashiva, Moshe Mordechai Epstein, who he brought in 12 years after he founded it, had founded the yeshiva. So what is this yeshiva in Slabotka like? What's the schedule? So the schedule was that uh, there was shachris at 7, morning prayer at 7, followed by breakfast, and they would start studying Talmud from 9 until 1. At 1, they would pray the afternoon prayer, mincha, and twice a week, uh, the session would end with a half-hour shir, a Talmudic lecture from Rosh Hashiva. After Mincha, there was lunch. And at 3 p.m., the afternoon session began, studying Talmud, from 3 until 9.30. At 9.30, there was a half-hour of Musr, where the students would study by themselves Musr, followed by the evening prayer, the, the, the whole argument, the whole conflict that embroiled the yeshiva world was about that last half hour, uh, 9.30 to 10, studying Musr, closing the Gemara, closing the Talmud, studying Musr, that was really the massive part, the, the large part, the bulk of the disagreement. Now, 10 o'clock, uh, that was, for many students, just the beginning. Many students would stay and study until the wee hours of the morning. It's interesting that the yeshiva schedule today is actually very similar, with slight modifications, very similar to the way it was instituted in Slabatka. But it, the highlight of the week in Slabatka was when the altar would give a shmuz, a musr discourse. And he would speak in a low voice, and there was total silence and concentration in the audience. Every student listening intently, very careful not to miss a word. And he would employ his encyclopedic knowledge of Talmud in the discourses and would stream together dozens of teachings in a lecture filled with brilliant insights and ideas. But interestingly, he wouldn't spell out his ideas in an easy to understand way. He wouldn't spoon feed his big picture ideas. He would, he would break up his talks with abrupt stops. He would leave conclusions unspecified and sometimes even not finish his sentences. And he wanted his students to be forced to actively employ their minds to assemble the pieces and to understand the message. And he created this tension around the talk. He wouldn't speak loudly. And it wouldn't be so unclear. So everyone beforehand is trying to clamor to find a good spot. And he's speaking without raising his voice, without getting animated, without singing or sing songs. There's no gesticulations. There's no oratory embellishments at all. He's just saying it in a way that, they, that, that they're captivated, but that they're hanging on to every word. And after the talk... The students would gather amongst themselves and discuss what exactly did he mean by this, what by that. This is the framework of the yeshiva 
of the first Musar Yeshiva in the world. And really, it's interesting, you know, we talk about history, the more recent, the more contemporary the individual or the event, the more information that you have about it. And, you know, when I started researching the subject, I had about 42 pages of notes about it. And I didn't even go through all the things that I wanted to see because I already had so many notes and it was too overwhelming to deal with it. But I think we gave a little picture about the personality and the institution of the altar of Slavatka. I still want to talk about what is the educational philosophy? What is this Musser approach? What was he trying to instill in his students? But we're going to hold off on that until part two. So this is going to be part one of the Rabbinessen Svifinkel and the Slabatka Revolution. Part two is going to be Rabbinessen Svifinkel and the Musser ideology. So stay tuned for that. Again, this podcast was dedicated in honor of Jeffrey and Beth Yaris. If you want to sponsor a Torah podcast, it could be in the recovery, in merit of the recovery of someone, uh, in loving memory of a loved one, in honor of someone, you could also sponsor it anonymously. anonymously please email me at rabbiwalby at gmail.com and stay tuned for part two of this fascinating individual and fascinating subject.